I hear that you've been uh, excited about regulation of stable coins. Is that like a uh, hot thing for you right now? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we're the purveyor of USDC, which is the largest regulated dollar stable coin in the world. And, uh, and rated much higher than Tether, right? Yeah? Yes. I mean, it's... it's uh, no, you know, quite. Uh, sort of obvious, right? It's regulated and fully reserved with Bank of New York Mellon and BlackRock and, uh, yeah. and, and sort of wi widely used in, uh, you know, many applications around the world. So, so what's going to happen when things are regulated? How is that going to change the world of uh, commerce, just generally, not just crypto? Yeah, so I mean, I think, and uh, you know, my interest in, and in particular in the AI topic related to this as well is um, what we're seeing happen is the building of a um, essentially a new internet-based financial system, and it's an internet-based financial system where uh, value can be exchanged effectively at the, with the same speed and efficiency and cost effectiveness as data. And there are these new networks, blockchain networks, that effectively provide an execution environment for money. And the really powerful thing about this is that in the next few years, we'll reach a point where essentially the marginal cost of moving around money will go to zero. And at the same time, these blockchain networks are essentially trust machines. They provide a way to have trustworthy data, trustworthy transactions, trusted compute. And it's the combination of that, the kind of smart contracts, the programmability of money, and the frictionless movement of money right. that, that makes, this, makes this really exciting. And so I think from you know, what, 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 make, what becomes possible? Well, once these are essentially treated as legal forms of money, which is happening around the world right now, right, right. Um, and you have this kind of infrastructure, it makes it possible for, effectively, for machines to um, enter into contracts on our behalf. So AI agents that can uh, transact with each other, transact with others uh, over a medium of, ex of exchange that is itself machine programmable. And so I'm, I'm interested in and, and looking forward to this convergence of machine intelligence, machine code generation, verifiable data, verifiable compute, and the ability for economic contracts to actually be both generated, uh, executed, and enforced by machines. And I think that's the convergence that uh, yeah. I'm excited about here. So one of the things you, you might not know about is we co-chair IETF uh, committee on exactly this. So there is now going to be a standard so that you know that it's trustworthy to move things from one network to the other. Because uh, currently, it's a source of a lot of fraud, a lot of, like half of the North Korea's uh, ICBM uh, program is from hacks. From yeah. hacks of yeah. stable coins. Of, of bridges. Of bridges, yeah. yeah. So, so, we, so we'll get rid of that, right? Yeah, so we, we and we, we have something called the cross chain transfer protocol. Yeah, which, so your protocol is really pretty good. Which, which actually got to make that, that everywhere, issue. right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So, one of the questions that comes up with the people that I talk about, talk to, is, are people like Swift who are moving to a blockchain like system. It's a distributed ledger system put on top of their existing system. Uh, well, how does that interact with what your vision is? Well, I think we're, we're, we're really focused on how to build new fundamental building blocks and protocols for the public internet. So um, public protocols uh, that are public APIs that any developer who wants to build an application to, that, that uses programmable money, that wants to build an application that uses Web3 native primitives, for them to be able to do that in a permissionless way and, uh, and, and to do that on a global basis. Um, I th so, so I think our, our vantage point is just very different. We're looking at this as an internet platform utility that is an open infrastructure for people to build on top of. Um, underneath, of course, the, the actual stable coins are you know, increasingly a highly regulated form of digital fiat money. Right. And, and so it sort of has kind of bank-like prudential regulation uh, around it. But the, the actual uh, technology layer is not a, 
an infrastructure that's tightly managed and controlled by a small set of private sector actors, it's actually the public internet. And, and I think we've seen that when you have open networks and open platforms uh, that are widely available that any developer can build on top of, that we see the most innovation. And so we're, we're just very focused on how to build this as open infrastructure on the internet uh, as opposed to kind of augmenting and adding on top of um, kind of legacy closed networks. Yeah, no, understood. So one of the, the problems or the, the concerns that people come up with is that you're not the only person in this game and the open internet is really the Western internet and that China, Russia, other entities are building a quite separate internet on, on top of TCP IP. But there, for instance, talking about BRICS coins, having a very different thing, which means the dollar wouldn't be a reserve currency the same way anymore. The rules of the road might be different in different countries. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a critical national security and national economic issue for the United States and certainly for other Western countries. I think that um, w w w the way I look at it is that we, we're in a digital currency space race and the future of currency competition is actually technology competition. Right. And what values do we want in that system? Do we want values that are grounded in open, free market, competitive, uh, uh, you know, you know yeah. full, full access? And I think that's largely what the world wants. And so the United States needs to lead there. It needs to obviously enable the private sector to innovate in this space. And it, and it should be, you know, driving essentially digital dollars like USDC as a major export product around the world because this essentially has the reach of the internet. I have so, to agree with you. Right? It's just like if this is a point of real competition because you have Belt and Road, you have other sort of initiatives, and those are competition. Right. And, and individuals and households will get to choose with their smartphone what global economic system they want to participate in. And, uh, and so that's a choice people will make. Now, there will be, you know, uh, uh, great firewalls that attempt to enforce a balkanized internet, as there already are, but um, I believe for most of the world, it will remain open. And in a world that is largely remains open, that's a tremendous opportunity for this kind of digital currency competition to, to take place and to thrive. So, so people wonder about uh, sort of a race to the bottom. So I could set up a system that doesn't have quite the overview that, say, the Western system does. It's a little cheaper as a consequence. Um, and wouldn't all the consumers go to that one, even though in the long run it's a bad choice? Well, I think um, this comes back to uh, a fundamental attribute of, of, of money and, and the use of money, which is it is grounded in trust. Um, and it, it is grounded in an individual or an entity's understanding of the fun fundamental safety and soundness of that instrument. It's why every person in the world would rather hold US dollars than almost any sure. other currency, because they understand that there is, you know, the, the, the most creditworthy, relatively speaking, uh, hopefully for a long time. Uh, <laughs> we hope, yes. Uh, 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 economy. And so, but that is, that is uh, you know, there are many, many dimensions to that trust. Um, and so I, I don't think it's as simple as, you know, here's this cheaper alternative, go use it. I think that, um, you know, you know d digital dollars and, and, and other, you know, other currencies, digital euros and the like, um, have network effects, have embedded trust and I think if you can build the technology infrastructure in a way which is also something that people can depend on and trust as well uh, that you can certainly have a situation where you can uh, you, you can prevail yeah I mean so one of the things that as a uh, as someone who advises some very large sovereign wealth funds and does things like that I noticed that in 2008 we had a problem and the problem really at its heart was the math was wrong. We used the wrong distributions in the models so that you could get the head of Lehman out there saying, this was a 26 standard deviation event, which is on the face of it stupid. Uh, we don't have events like that. What we have is bad models. And so when you get something that's a very liquid network where you can move things around or you can have essentially DeFi, it becomes hard to know that you're doing it right. Well, this is a fundamental, um 
I wouldn't call it a paradox, but it's one of the really fundamental things about this. Blockchain infrastructure emerged in part as a reaction to the global financial crisis. Yeah. Both to establish more sound forms of money, to avoid some of the pitfalls of leverage and fractional reserve banking, um, and, and that's actually embedded even in full reserve dollar stable coins, which do not seek to take money and then rehypothecate it and lend it, but instead hold it in full reserve. But I think importantly is um, you're going to have, I like to call it the new physics of money. Blockchain networks essentially gives money the physics of internet data. And so when you have the physics of internet data, you're going to have the highest velocity money that the world has ever had, and you're already seeing that. And so I think you're right, with this incredibly high velocity money, doesn't that, doesn't that allow just an unprecedented amount of risk to proliferate? But the flip side is that if done right, everything is, can be built on provable, verifiable, real-time auditable networks. And you can build, you know, uh, uh, effectively a level of visibility into capital, risk, liquidity, and, and flows. And you can have a, a real-time visibility into it that would be unbelievable from a regulatory perspective uh, as well. And so properly designed, you should be able to have a radically more larger financial system, a, radically, a financial system with significantly more reach than we have today that increases economic velocity and something that is fundamentally safer. So I, be I believe that it's possible to build something like what you're saying, but if I look at current high frequency trading, I see crashes regularly. So things, but the crashes only last for a millisecond. Right? What that means, though, is that somehow the equations, the strategies that are being done, which are, you know, mathematical, they're, they're things that ought to be solid, have these bugs, and we're just fortunate that they recover really quickly. So, so there's worry that as you make that across the entire world and you make the amount of money trading large, you're going to get those sorts of things also. And then the other thing is, is it like you look at high frequency trading, the only people can do it are really, really wealthy people who have special access to the, you know, they're, they're half a millisecond away from the central server that does the resolution. The rest of us just have to live on the crumbs. How, how can you start, so, so I believe you about the infrastructure, but then there's this other sort of thing of like what's actually happening and who's able to actually put the resources together to get at it in a competitive way? Well, th th there's a lot going on in the on-chain finance space and um, even, even something like an automated market maker, which is a, a, an invention of DeFi, uh, allows an individual to basically provide liquidity to what is effectively a market making strategy uh, that can be very, very sophisticated. You're also actually seeing um, you know, a a AI and, 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 and crypto convergence in the sense that um, you're, you're seeing protocols that effectively allow people to pool behind highly sophisticated, you know, automated sure. market making strategies and, and pr effectively fund those almost like an LP funding citadel or yeah. you know, what, what, what have you. And so you, you, you do have, you know, uh, what I would say green shoots of this kind of democratization to access to hyper efficient market structures. So one final question, because we're running out of time. So. Given that there are these concerns about the algorithms and the math, not the infrastructure, how would you start off in a way where we can sort of sandbox this or be cautionary before we sort of release it on the world? Well, I think it's tricky. <laughs> um, you know, clearly public blockchains are a, are a public computing surface and there's just a constant amount of innovation that's happening. So. There are options protocols, derivatives protocols, lending protocols, all, all these things that are being built. Uh, and that is the laboratory. That is the sandbox. Okay, well, I think a lot of people would like to see a smaller sandbox that's a little safer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy.